Well, as we come to the word of God this morning, let's bow together in a word of prayer. Our Father, we ask as we open your word this morning that you would please assist us. Assist me as I preach your word that you would help me to be clear and accurate. I pray for the church as they listen, that you would give them attentive hearts. And Father, that all of us would want to hear from you that we might follow you more faithfully. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, it, it uh, is good to be back. My family and I are glad to be back and among you. And I want to publicly thank uh, TJ and Luke and Pastor Art for filling in the pulpit while I was gone. It is such a blessing to know that this, the Word of God will be handled accurately and competently from this pulpit even uh, in my absence, and so I trust you were blessed in the weeks of their ministry. We enjoyed some time in the mountains of Northern California, enabling the kids to splash in rivers and rummage through dirt um, and find all sorts of critters. Uh, it was a great time. We were, uh, it was remote, and we were completely out of range of masks and out of range of uh, cell service, too. Uh, but it was a good time to read, to rest, and to play uh, with the kids. And we've rejuvenated, and we're glad to be back and ready to hit the ground running here. But as we came down from the mountain uh, and entered back into this world of COVID, of uh, masks and distancing and strange requirements here and there that I keep forgetting about, um, you just see a society that's occupied with many things. People are have a lot on their minds, a lot to take in, a lot to think about, a lot to try to take care of. And everyone's trying to navigate these unprecedented times, and jobs have been affected, schools have been affected, lives are affected, and that goes for all of us here as well. And on top of this, of course, there's a hotly debated election that's coming later this year. But in a society that is so occupied with many things and is so sophisticated and modern as ours, is there a place for Jesus Christ? You know, if you were to pick up a copy of the New York Times and read through it and all the concerns that are, that are facing our world today, you can kind of get this question of uh, going, okay, is there any place for Jesus? It seems that Jesus is the furthest thing from anybody's minds right now. I mean, what does Jesus have to do with a medical emergency? What does Jesus have to do with a struggling economy? It's almost like to talk about Jesus seems irrelevant or off topic, changing the subject. But friends, Jesus has not grown irrelevant. We have maybe pushed him to the corners of our minds and the edges of our society, but Jesus is still Lord. He's Lord of the church. He's Lord of the world. This is a world that belongs to him, and one day he will return to rule over it. And because he is Lord, Jesus is the answer, the only answer for our world today. All those pressing concerns that, that are there in the New York Times or on any, uh, all the news feeds, Jesus is what the world needs more than ever. And really, this is the truth that the Bible seeks to proclaim from cover to cover. The world needs Christ. And this is what the church has been proclaiming for 2,000 years. World, you need Christ. You see, no one else is worthy of our allegiance. No one else is Lord. No one else is worthy of our worship. And no one else fits the qualifications as laid out in the Old Testament Scriptures to be Christ the Messiah. You see, when Jesus began his ministry in Israel in autumn AD 29, he claimed to be that one. He claimed to be the one that the Old Testament prophets had foretold. In the Gospel of Luke that we've been studying, he made this claim most notably in chapter 4, verses 16 to 21. He told the people assembled in the synagogue there in Nazareth that he 
was the messianic king who had come to set up his kingdom. He was the Christ, the Messiah. And Luke, the historian, who's, who's documenting this life of Christ, after recording that claim to Messiahship, he then goes on to show evidences of that Messiahship. Jesus claimed to be the promised Messiah, and then he showed evidences to back up that claim. Now, last month, when we were last here in the book of Luke, we looked at the first evidence where he cast out a demon out of a man. And today, we're going to look at the remaining evidences in Luke chapter 4. And so, I invite you to take out your personal copy of God's holy, inspired word and turn to Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4, where we'll be studying this morning. We're going to see Jesus unveil, Jesus reveal himself to the, the nation of Israel and, by extension, to us. And as he reveals himself, as Jesus shows who he is, his true colors, we, we need to pay attention. We need to see Jesus for all he is and all that he's claimed to be. We need an accurate, true, full portrait of Jesus, the Messiah. Now, before we read our verses, let's set the context since it's been a few weeks. Again, as we said, Jesus recently started his public ministry. He had grown up in Israel, and then he was baptized, and he launched him into his public ministry in Galilee. He had a murderous rejection at Nazareth, his hometown, where they sought to kill him. But then he moved his base of operations from there, Nazareth, his hometown, to Capernaum, which was a small fishing town on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee. And for those familiar with the gospel accounts, many events take place in and around this area of Capernaum. On the Sabbath, Jesus enters the synagogue in Capernaum, and after teaching, he's confronted with a demon-possessed man who he then rebukes, and the evil spirit leaves and, and exits the man. The evil spirit obeys Jesus immediately. As you can imagine, this event caused news to spread rapidly through the countryside and through the surrounding area. That there is one who's in Capernaum, and he's got power, and he's got authority. Now, this is where we left off last time. So let's begin to read our passage. We're going to read Luke chapter 4, starting in verse 38. Follow along as I read through the end of the chapter. And he, Jesus, arose and left the synagogue and entered Simon's house. When Simon's mother-in-law was ill with a high fever, and they appealed to him on her behalf. And he stood over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her. And immediately she rose and began to serve them. Now when the sun was setting, all those who had any who were sick with various diseases brought them to him. And he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. And demons also came out of many, crying, You are the Son of God. But he rebuked them and would not allow them to speak, because they knew he was the Christ. And when it was day, he departed and went into a desolate place. And the people sought him and came to him and would have kept him from leaving. But he said to them, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to other towns as well, for I was sent for this purpose. And he was preaching in the synagogues of Judea. In this passage, we're going to see Jesus reveal his power and his purpose. First, let's look at how Jesus reveals his power in verses 38 through 41. Jesus reveals his power in verses 38 through 41. And in these verses, we see him reveal his power both privately and publicly. Both privately and publicly. First, privately in verses 38 and 39. Here it says in verse 38 that he arose and left the synagogue. We are still in the same day that started in verse 31. 
when he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath. Here he rises and leaves the synagogue, and it says he enters Simon's house. Now this is Simon Peter, and this is the first mention in Luke's gospel of this disciple, or really of any disciple. The disciples have not been mentioned yet in Luke's account. But the other gospel writers tell us that Simon, his brother Andrew, and James and John all went to Simon's house after the synagogue. These men already somewhat affiliated with Jesus at this point. Now the calling of Simon and the other disciples won't be until chapter 5, and so it doesn't fit Luke's purposes to include their names here. Now when Jesus changed his base of operations from, from Nazareth to Capernaum, it seems that he moved in with Simon Peter. You know, our Lord famously said that he had no place to lay his head. He did not have a permanent residence, a place for him to live. But yet he had many friends, many people he could stay with in different towns and different places. And here in Capernaum, it seems that Simon Peter's house was a place that he would go. Now, upon entering the house, Jesus was told that there's a problem, that Simon's mother-in-law was ill with a fever. And just as a side note, let's note the fact that Simon has a mother-in-law, which means that Peter was married, which means that the whole claim to uh, celibacy in the priesthood of the Roman Catholic Church is, uh, is false to begin with. But it says that Simon's mother-in-law is ill with a high fever. Luke is the only one to say that it was a high fever. Luke, the physician, of course, would note that. And the people are there. They see Jesus walk in and they come over to him and they plead with him and they say, Jesus, can you, this, this lady, Simon's mother-in-law, is, is ill. Can you do anything? It says they, they appealed to him. They asked if he would do something. Now, in, in the course of, of the Gospel of Luke, we don't have that many miracles that have happened so far, but we know that he's done a lot of ministry already. John chapter 1 has recorded many events in ministry that aren't recorded in the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And so word about Jesus has continued to spread. And so these people know that Jesus has, has power. And so they ask him to do something for this woman. Jesus responds to the request by moving over to the woman as she lays down. It, she must have looked in bad shape for the people to be so concerned. You know, when someone gets a fever, we kind of believe they can get over it, wait it out, see this, have their body fight it, and maybe they'll get, get better. But here it seems to be at such a level that they are deeply concerned. But Jesus brings his presence to help. He stands over her, it says, verse 39, and he stood over her. Mark says that he took her by the hand showing his intimacy and his care for this woman. He's moving in to free this woman from a great fever that has bound her up. And Jesus, then there to his friends, he reveals his power by rebuking the fever. He speaks to the fever, Luke records. Rebuked it. This word rebuke is used three times in this chapter. Verse 35, here in verse 39, and then also in verse 41. Rebuke, rebuke, rebuke. Jesus is speaking with power and authority. So much so that a, a demon leaves a man. So much so that a fever leaves this woman. Jesus does not need to say any incantations. He doesn't need to mix up any potions. He simply speaks and the fever departs. This shows Jesus with authority and power like the creator God back in Genesis chapter 1 who spoke and this world came to be. So Jesus speaks and demons obey him and sicknesses obey him. Now, to preclude anyone from doubting the completeness of Jesus' miracle here, someone's saying, well, you know, she was probably getting better anyway. That's, and he just kind of capitalized on that and, and spoke, and it looked like she got better. Luke 
And the other gospel writers include the fact that immediately she rose up and began to serve the people in the house. You see, this isn't just a fever breaking. Because when a fever breaks, someone still lays in bed for a while, still weak, often too weak to get up and do anything. And so they make an emphatic point that this woman is completely healed. She gets up and immediately starts doing stuff as if nothing had happened. She's restored to full strength and is happily serving those in the house. I mean, you can imagine everyone standing around with their jaws on the floor and just going, and she's asking if you want any cheese and crackers. And you're going, you were just, and they're just amazed at what Jesus has just done. Can't imagine the, the conversation that afternoon as they all sat around and enjoyed a meal. So this is the first miracle here, but it was only to a small group, an intimate setting, private setting. But pretty soon, it's going to be seen by a whole lot more, as Luke records in verses 40 to 41. So we've seen him reveal his power privately. Now he's going to reveal his power publicly, verses 40 and 41. Now, verse 37 says that reports about him went out into every place into the surrounding region around Capernaum. Verse 40 in our passage here this morning tells us the effect of that news. What happens when the news of a healer in Capernaum spreads throughout a surrounding region? Verse 40. Now, when the sun was setting, all those who had any who were sick with various diseases, brought them to him, and he laid hands on every one of them and healed them. Now, according to Sabbath law, Jews were not able to travel far on the Sabbath day. They went from sundown Friday night to sundown on Saturday. So what the gospel writers, Luke here, is telling us that when the sun was setting, that the Sabbath day was over, and the people could now begin to travel. So it's as the sun that's, is going down, Jesus' ministry is starting to heat up. They're now able to travel, able to come from miles around to come to Capernaum, bringing their sick, bringing their ill. And put yourself in the shoes of someone, let's say, who's in Cana or in Bethsaida, and someone comes running in telling you that, that Jesus is in Capernaum and that he's healing people. And let's say so one of your family members is ill, has a serious health issue. What would you do if you heard that this was only a few miles away? How far would you go if these claims were true? If that neighbor boy that you knew was born lame was suddenly walking around you and playing with your kids? How far would you take your child if you knew she could be healed? I mean, you can imagine the fervor and the drive that would, that would cause people to flock to see Jesus. The theologian B.B. Warfield has famously said that Jesus effectively banished sickness and disease from northern Galilee for a season. As he traveled around, there were less and less uh, those with physical maladies they, as they continued to be healed. I caught a glimpse of some of this local excitement, what it would have been like on the ground uh, through the writing of uh, Elizabeth Spear. She wrote in 1962 a book named The Bronze Bow, and some of you may be familiar with that fictitious story that takes place in biblical times. And so this is a a, a fictitious dialogue, but I thought it, it helped capture what it might have been like on the ground with this excitement growing uh, of, of hearing about Jesus. It, just to uh, set the stage of this dialogue, there's two boys, Daniel and Joel, who are looking for Jesus, known in the story as the preacher. And they talk with a small family who's also walking to see, go see Jesus. And the The small family asked, Do you know which would be the house of Simon the fisherman? We're looking for it ourselves. The man nodded, With so many looking, it shouldn't be hard to find, but the boy is getting tired. We walked all the way from Cana today. They told us in town that the preacher would be at the home of Simon tonight. 
Daniel glanced at the child, noting the way he hugged one arm close to his body, wrapped in his mantle. It's his hand, the woman explained. She reached out and pulled the mantle aside, and both boys started at the glimpse of red, swollen flesh. The child flashed them a look of fury and jerked the mantle back into place and trudged on, his eyes on the road. Bit by a camel, the man said, two months ago and it won't heal. I'm a weaver and so the boy must come after me uh, and a weaver needs two good hands. We only heard about the preacher yesterday, said the woman. We have not wasted any time. Daniel was puzzled. This preacher, is he a doctor as well? He asked, where do you come from? Haven't you heard about the preacher? The man demanded. Our neighbor who came back from Capernaum said that they talk of nothing else. My neighbor saw him heal a man who had been lame for 20 years. The man ran, he told me, ran like a young boy. If this preacher can do that, he can heal my son. Again, this exchange is fictitious, but you can understand the concern, the excitement that is within people as they heard about Jesus who was healing in Capernaum. Again, how far would you go? How soon would you leave? And this is why Mark records that the house was packed. It was packed to the door. No one could get in. Everyone was there trying to bring their sick one, cramming in to see this amazing man. But Jesus did not just put on a healing show. He wasn't there just to heal generally, but to heal specific people. Look what the verse says in verse 40. It says, all these people brought them to him, and he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. Wow. The love, the grace, the intimacy to look at each person, I imagine, in the eye as he heals them, to understand the soul that, that he is helping as he touches each one. In this day of COVID, we can appreciate even more that human touch. Now, as he shows elsewhere in his ministry, he doesn't need to touch people to heal them. He can simply speak and bring about healing. But I believe he does this to show his personal care, to show that, yes, he is Israel's Messiah, the great messianic king who's going to smite the nations and set up his kingdom. But he's a king who's concerned and cares for each one of his subjects. Now, there's no precedent for this. Jesus was not following some example from the Old Testament or from rabbinic Judaism. This is totally unique to Jesus, and he makes it a part of his ministry. Now, on top of healing sicknesses, Luke adds that demons also came out of people. It says, verse 41, and demons also came out of many. Now, this could have been attached to sicknesses. Someone might have had a debilitating sickness, and there might have been a demon that accompanied it. But as we talked about last month, that uh, demon possession and sickness were, were two separate things, even though demon possession could bring about physical results, physical maladies in the person they occupied. But it says that they came out of many crying, you are the son of God. Now this was a, a, a tactic where the demons were trying to control Jesus, where they, if they knew the name, I know who you are, it was a way to control him and, and try to be and have the upper hand. But Jesus clearly shows that he has the upper hand. But he rebuked them. Again, our third mention of the word rebuke in this chapter and, they, and would not allow them to speak because they knew he was the Christ. They knew who he was, but Jesus doesn't want testimony from satanic forces. He's looking to see the people confess him. He's not looking to hear demons confess him. So here in these two vignettes, we see Jesus revealing his power to the people at Capernaum. Was it... Was he doing it simply to amaze? Was he simply to be a popular man, gain publicity? Well, this leads us to the second aspect. Why did Jesus do what he did? What was his purpose? That's the second thing Jesus reveals. First, he reveals his power. Secondly, in this passage, he reveals his purpose. 
And let's look at that in verses 42 through 44. Jesus reveals his purpose. Now, verse 42 resumes the narrative in the morning. Again, the day before was a long day. He was started at the, the synagogue in the morning. He has a demon possession. He goes, leaves there, and uh, he, he heals Simon's mother-in-law. They have some time until the sun goes down, and then who knows how late into the night he's healing people. But here, verse 42, and when it was day, he departed and went into a desolate place. Mark tells us that it was, while it was still dark, it was that, that very early part of the morning. It was still dark. He leaves Capernaum and goes out into a desolate place to be alone. And yet, even though he was probably tired, even though he was weary, he knew that what was most important was that he spend time with his father. Luke does not re- record this for some reason, but Mark tells us that he went out to this desolate place in order to pray. He needed to commune with his heavenly father. Even though Jesus prayed throughout the day, even though he communed with his father on a moment-by-moment basis, he, of all people, practiced the presence of God, fully aware that he walking with his father and seeking to do his father's will every moment of the day and yet note that he set aside time to go and to be alone undistracted undisturbed to pray and i believe this is a worthy example for us to follow as well yes we walk with the lord every day yes we pray with him throughout our day as we go from here to there but there's something about private uninterrupted time with the Lord that is needful for us and for our souls. If our Lord needed it, we need it a thousand times more, do we not? Well, we see here that Jesus, as he's communing with his Father to find time alone, is interrupted. He's not alone for long. It uh, feels like a parent with small children trying to get time, (laughs) peace and quiet, and somehow There's a knock at the door, and the munchkins find you. Um, Here, Jesus goes out to a desolate place, but it says, and the people sought him and came to him and would have kept him from leaving. So they hunt him down. I mean, you can imagine how late into the night that healing ministry was, and and people that, that were healed or whatever and stayed there that night, people that maybe walked all night just to get there by the morning. It's early morning and, and the talking has begun. There's a murmur in town. People are looking for this healer. And they go knock on Simon's door and they say, hey, where is he? Isn't he in there? And Simon looks around and he goes, no, he's already gone. And, and Mark tells us that Simon with the other friends and disciples actually go looking for Jesus. So basically on behalf of the crowd, Simon's going, listen, they're banging my door down. You gotta get back there. They want, they want to see you. They're seeking him out, looking for him intently. Luke tells us what the crowd's intent was, though. Look at it. Verse 42. They would have kept him from leaving them. They didn't want Jesus to go. They would have kept him. The the word translated kept means to hold fast. They would have held on to Jesus and wouldn't let him go. You're ours, Jesus. You belong to Capernaum. You see, they wanted to control Jesus for their own desires. Yes, this is a much more favorable response than Nazareth, who dragged him out of the synagogue and tried to push him over a cliff to kill him. So you say, good job, Capernaum. It's a little bit better. But they weren't really willing to submit to Jesus. They wanted to control him for their designs and their purposes. They thought they knew what was best for Jesus. They loved his miracles. They loved what he did. But Jesus will be controlled by no person. He is beholden to the will of God, his Father. And so look at what Jesus says in verse 43. But he said to them, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns as well. For I was sent for this purpose. Here Jesus reveals the purpose for why he was sent. 
We have to ask, who sent him? He says, I was sent. He didn't say, for this purpose I came. He says, for this purpose I was sent. It's passive. There's someone else doing the action. Of course, it's his Father in heaven. Jesus understands that he was sent by his Father for a specific purpose, and that is to proclaim the gospel of the kingdom of God. This he must do all over Israel. The next verse says he was preaching in the synagogues of Judea. Now, if you know your Israeli geography in the first century, Judea was the, the province in the lower part of the country around Jerusalem. And so some believe this is a, an error that he, that he has said Judea. He should have said Galilee because that's where Jesus was. But Judea sometimes is used uh, of the country as a whole. And I believe that's what Luke's doing here, that Jesus was teaching in the synagogues of Israel. And he says it of Judea. He needs to go to the whole nation. That's why Jesus says, I must go to other towns as well. C Capernaum has no exclusive rights to Jesus. Now, back in verses 18 and 19 that we looked at uh, several weeks ago, he read from Isaiah 61, revealing that those verses described himself and his mission. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, he said, because he has appointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. And the, the main, the verbs that are used in verses 18 and 19, quoted from Isaiah 61, are the same verbs over here in verses 43 and 44. The verbs of proclaim good news, sent, and preach. So what Luke is doing is showing, yeah, you know that passage that Jesus says, that's me, I'm that Messiah? Well, he, he then went and performed that same ministry. He then fulfilled that passage. He proclaimed good news. He was sent. He preached. He demonstrated that claim to be true. After being anointed with the Holy Spirit at his baptism, Jesus went into Israel proclaiming the good news that he was the longed-for Messiah. He was the one Israel had been waiting for. He was the king which the prophets foretold. And his miracles would point to this emphatically because you see Isaiah chapter 35 talks about the messianic era and it says that in that time, the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf, deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap like a deer and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. You see, when the Messiah comes, this is what's gonna take place. And so they're seeing all this take place in front of them. They should go, this is him. He is the one the Old Testament has spoken of. And as they saw this, as they saw this alignment between Jesus and his ministry and what the Old Testament has said, it should have produced faith. They should have trusted in Jesus and devoted their lives to him and believed in him and adopted him and embraced him as their king. This is what he was calling for. He was pushing for a decision that they would, they would accept him. They would see him as the king, the deliverer, the prophet, who would save them from spiritual darkness and physical bondage. And so this preaching tour that he says he must go on is the process of Jesus offering himself to the nation. And in response, they must repent of their sin and follow him. Which is why John the Baptist would preach, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The king is coming. Repent and be spiritually ready for him. Now, if they would have accepted him, he would have set up his messianic kingdom, the kingdom of God spoken of here, then in the first century. But they didn't accept him, and the kingdom of God would be taken from that generation and be given to a future generation. As it stands today, the kingdom of God is still future. We await the establishment of it here on earth, ruled by the true Son of God in flesh and blood on this planet, as he is destined to do. And so the good news that we proclaim now is that Jesus is yet to return. Jesus is coming back. The Son of God, the Messiah, the rightful King, will come to this planet and will reign and will rule with righteousness crushing his enemies and setting up a kingdom of peace and righteousness. 
he's coming back to judge his enemies and to save his saints. Folks, we've seen here in this passage this morning, Jesus reveal his power, reveal his purpose for why God sent him. We've seen that he is the mighty Messiah. He has the power. He has the authority. He has the right to do any and all things. And so for us here today, the arrival of this king will either be one of great joy or one of great terror. But the good news is is that you can know for sure that you will be a citizen in that future kingdom. That you can be guaranteed that you will have a place in the Messiah's kingdom when it is established here on earth. This is the gospel we proclaim today. That by trusting and following Jesus, by repenting of our sins today, and by depending upon him and him alone, we have a place in that future kingdom. All we must do is repent of our sin, believe in Jesus, believe that when he died upon the cross, that his blood was shed for us, that his blood was shed on our behalf, that I don't have to die, I don't have to be punished for my sins because Jesus was slaughtered for my sin. He took my place. He is my substitute. And as we trust in that and believe in that, we can take that to the grave knowing that our place is secure with the Lord. You see, following Jesus is not simply being a good person. It's not simply being a spiritual person. Following Jesus means to renounce yourself. We leave all of ourself at the door. I bring nothing to the table. No righteousness, no good deeds. All I bring is need and sin and rotten vileness. A rotten vileness that that Christ is able to heal, Christ is able to save, and Christ is able to transform. This is what it means to follow the king today. We must recognize that we've fallen short of God's standard, that we've sinned against a holy God, and then it's seeing the new life that is offered by trusting in Jesus. Jesus is the mighty king. He has ascended to heaven and is waiting when he can come and set up his kingdom. But he is Lord. And this truly is the fundamental Christian confession. As you remember, Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified. And with the mouth, one confesses and is saved. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved today and be guaranteed a spot in that future kingdom. Church, we know our king will return. And when he does, he will heal, he will restore, he will establish us, he will set everything right. He has the power to do it as we saw in this passage. And so we pray. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Amen? Let's bow together in prayer. Oh, Father, we do ask that you would send your son quickly, that he would come to establish his kingdom, that he would establish it in righteousness, ridding this world of the evil, of the rebellion, of the wickedness that surrounds us. And may you bring righteousness upon this earth forever and ever. I pray for all those here, Lord. If there's one who does not know whether they have a a place in that future kingdom, that they would not leave today without resolving that, without trusting in Christ and repenting of their sins. We thank you for all these things in Christ's name. Amen.